Right, let's, let's say a prayer. <laughs> Father, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chance to have this conversation about you. Help us understand better today what you've done for us and how to call And we learn more about you and your love for us day by day. We entrust this conversation to you the hands of our mother as we say, Yeah. yeah. Oh, the grace, the grace of the Lord, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've got a request to slow down. So I'm going to uh, have Mr. Bashir be you know, the, the referee. <laughs> So, if I talk too fast, throw a yellow card or a red card, and I'll be your job. And this is a bit too pure. That was too late, Lucy. That was what I was doing. Kind of embarrassing. So, it's on take two now. <laughs> so, no, no, honestly, if you talk too fast, please let me know. Because I can't hear myself. <laughs> Well, if the acoustics go through, kind of throw me off a of half depth and what machinery and all that. So <laughs> what? The acoustics, really? the acoustics, he said. Yeah. No, look, honestly, I know I talk too fast. I know there are times that I hear myself talk too fast. So it's, it's not a bad thing to slow me down so you can repeat that. It's not good. And there everyone is, else would be appreciated too. There is a reason he puts his on every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't there yesterday. No English. Oh, I, remember, I, I put an extra copy. You did put out extras. I saw you. But there wasn't there for by one o'clock. Yes, I liked it. Put out an extra. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at then last time we covered uh, does the judgeship of Saul of Samuel start that? And Samuel is in old age. Um, just like Eli's sons fail. Samuel's sons begin to fail as well. And so Samuel, he's the high priest. His sons are also priests. And they also are all his successive judges. But they can take bribes. Um, and so the people don't trust them anymore. Now, in this series of years, you had, in Eli, you had the priests who were um, messing around with sacrifices. So they were, they didn't trust sacraments being done, they were being done according to the law. I have Samuel's sons who are taking bribes and who are making judgment based upon the priests of the palm, right? Because the people in frustration made a man king. And this was great Samuel's heart. Samuel, for his entire life, has been dedicated to God, trying to probe God, God, trying to get rid of, rid of this. Um, he's the one who, who dedicated the people back to the God, to the back to the Lord. His children are called. His children were to listen to the form of footsteps. And so Samuel, hearing that the people want a king, this is great, his heart. The people ask for a king in a way. They ask for a king because. We want to be. Like every other nation. Right, see, the law established God as king. The law established that God was to be the ruler, that the people who were the leaders were judges, they weren't kings. There was this confederation uh, of the tribes, but God was the ruler. God was what united them into one. God was what made them to be one people. Was they follow the king when they follow God? It's the law. So Samuel, when he hears the word king, he breaks his heart. God responds to him, 1 Samuel chapter 8. He says this. Samuel was displeased when they asked for a king to go. And 
Because the king's job is both to rule, to protect, and to judge. You know? it, 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 uh, back in those days, the king's job was to make final judgments. Remember, think of King Solomon, where the people would come to King Solomon you know, for wisdom. It wasn't just it wasn't because, of, it wasn't because of his own personal wisdom, it was because of his place as well. Uh, the kings were the lawmen, the kings were the leaders. Anyway. Samuel was displeased when he asked for a king to judge them. It's a regret that he's sort of correct for himself as well. He sees the judge, so are his sons. He prayed to the Lord about it, who said an answer. Grant the people's every request. It is not you they reject. They are rejecting me as As they have treated me constantly from the day I brought them up to this day, deserting me and worshiping strange gods, so they treat me too. Now grant the request that the same time ordered that solemnly and according to the rights the king will rule. If the king's the best of everything, the king's going to take their lands and their people and their sons for soldiers and everything else. But they want to be like a brother nation. And so at this point, Samuel goes off to anoint the king. Samuel goes off to look for one who's going to take his place as judge. So when he make the nation again by the nation. And it looks like a hell. It looks like there's going, this is a rejection of the law, this is Moses failing, this is Samuel failing, this is, this is, but God being God uses this to bring about the salvation of the world. In fact, God's not surprised. This isn't a surprise for God, this is outside of his plan. This isn't something that God didn't see coming. All the way back in Genesis chapter 49, we see the first revelation of a king. And this is a preparation for the Messiah. In Genesis chapter 49, Jacob is dying. And he has his twelve in Egypt, in the story of Joseph. Uh, Jacob and all the twelve tribes are in Egypt. So Joseph. And so Jacob is dying, he's giving his blessing to his twelve sons. When he comes to Judah, he says this. Judah is a lion's web. From the prey of my son, O God. He stooped down and crouched the lion as a lioness. He dares to rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. For the ruler sat between his feet and the council of the laws. And to him should be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his whole divine, his asses called the choice vine. He washed his garments of wine and vested them of the grapes. His eyes should be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. And remember, who at this point, which of the tribes and ruler? We try to say that we ruler of the twelve. That was Jacob. Who's who of the, the brothers? Who's in charge? Joseph. Joseph you know, and his son, Nasa and Ephraim. Uh, it's Joseph, not, not Judah. Judah's not the oldest. There is a very surprising thing, but the more surprising actually is what's said here. Um, there's a couple words here, quick key terms here in this, in this verse, which might not click me right away. And so, first of all, there's the fact that, um, again, there's, there's the, the scepter won't depart. Well, the scepter isn't there. Yeah, the scepter won't depart. But secondly, he says that. Uh, him shall belong the obedience of the peoples. Nations. In Hebrew, the word is goy, or goyi, plural. Now, the nation, when you see nations or people, that's the first Israel, it means the pagans. The going even of pagans. And so it says that the nations will obey him. He's saying he's ruler not just of Israel, he's ruler of the world. He's saying every people will obey Judah. 
Other people will obey his summons. And no one will dare to even think about posting because he's like a lion crushing over a prey. You ever had a dog you feed? You ever taken the bowl away from the dog and reading? You know. So when he says that he's like a lion crushing over a prey, that's what he's talking about. You know, the reading, don't go in game, you take that some from you. Not on the reading. Right? Even a puppy, you try to take food from a puppy and it's not at A lion twice as much, right? So this is a lion crushed over his prey. No one's going to bother. So the, he's saying everyone is under his feet, the whole world is beneath him, the whole world is coming. But then it says, except for Shildapar, when? When the one comes to whom the scepter belongs. So who is the ruler of nations? God. God is the ruler of nations. This is a prophecy of the incarnation. It's a proclamation that there will be a king in Judah. It's a proclamation that God will be king. But, but there's more to it than that. You also have the term here, Vah. When you see vine, a vineyard, this moment in the scripture refers to Israel. The book of Isaiah, especially, because Jeremiah, talks about Israel as a choice vine. This is repeated by Christ in his parables. There was owner who had a vineyard, and they refused to give him the grapes. Everyone knows what this means. This, this is a common trope. The uh, book of Hebrews talks about Israel as, as a vine and, and the, the pagan people who wrapped off the vine. So when he says that he comes to Israel, he's saying he's coming to he's going to buy us over the vine, the choice vine, and wash his garments in the blood of the grape. Well, you don't wash your garments in blood. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to, you throw grape juice on, on your garment. It's not going to wash them. This is, a, this is a prophecy of the cross and the Eucharist, which will wash the garment, in other words, the flesh, will wash the humanity. Through the blood, the blood of the grape. In the Holy Communion, you have through the blood of Christ, just wash and glass. And this makes one receive purity. So this, this what point would this have been understood like that versus just an interesting turn of phrase? Or With which part? The whole blood of grape. Not until Christ. Uh, because the, the once Christ comes to the Eucharist is dead, it's dead. Um, this, is, this is why Paul will say um, that, you know, the Old Testament is the veil of Christ comes. Um, that if you try to read the Old Testament without being Christ into it, you're miss it. Because this is a prophecy. Now, Jacob probably understood this. Uh, there may be some of the prophets who understood this as a whole. Most people would have just said this is interesting. It's a, uh, just a description of that he's king. But the whole fact he's king of the nations, they, they would have said that well, he deserves that. You know, they were expecting a Messiah. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't the Messiah. Uh, but they were expecting a political Messiah. They were expecting a Messiah to be king of Saul. And so they were expecting a earthly one. Um, and, and so they, they, they got some of this stuff. I mean, they, they understood that Israel was there, understood that he would be there. You know, Israel, the Bible is Israel. And the, there's something there about, about the great being Israel and the people, but it wouldn't have been clear. It wouldn't have thought cross you first. But this, this is a prophecy. About the incarnation, the passion, the Eucharist, and the key to the cross taking place in Judah. Right? That from Judah comes the Messiah. Um, that, and this part, that was understood until King David. Right? Because David is the king of Israel from Judah. But at this point, when Jacob speaks this prophecy, it's not the most important problem. 
Judah's not the oldest of the brothers. He's not the one leading them. He's not the one taking care of them. Uh, he wasn't even the most virtuous of them. Is he the oldest and one of the wives concubines? That one of the matter to is he's not the first one. Um, so, I mean, I mean, because the, the firstborn son gets the name of the inheritance. Um, and so he, he may be one of the older ones, I have to check it out, don't talk my head. Um, but the one that mattered in terms of his position of authority. He says that Jacob wanted to as the firstborn of Rachel. Yes, yes. So, but so that would be the same with Judah. Joseph was the first, but, the, but it wasn't. It, so I asked a question again, so it's really cool. You asked it backwards, I think it's false purposes. Okay. Um, since Jacob and what happened to him too, but his father, but um, they picked ones that are not the first born child to do right. a man. So uh, I was just wondering if maybe Judah, because I can't remember who was the mother of who was <laughs> the last two. Right. Um, um, I was just wondering if maybe he was the firstborn of one of them, and so it still was like a firstborn as a dad. And the Jewish concept only made a difference. Uh, because the fact that many wives, the firstborn son of, of the man, not of the Because the inheritance comes from the father. Uh, and, and so Joseph and Benjamin, uh, Joseph wouldn't have seen the firstborn son. Right. I mean, he was the firstborn son of, of Rachel, but not the firstborn son of. But if the father had the right to do that, right? He, or, he did, but remember, he didn't, he didn't receive it from. In the case of Jacob, it was a trick because we're back. In the case of Joseph, the inheritance doesn't come from Jacob, it comes from Beth. I'm sorry, it's from. So, so Joseph, in, in terms of the 12 tribes, Joseph has no authority. The only reason why he has any special role is because he gives it to the act of love, the favor. Jacob plays favorites, so there's not a special blessing here. His role comes from God and from Pharaoh. So wasn't the robe he was supposed to wear it's supposed to signify? No, it was, it was just a special gift. It was, it was just quite a thing. It doesn't say by anything about it. means spiritually it does. But in terms of rights or authority or blessing, all it is is he gets special from Christ. Okay. Sorry, I, didn't, um, I thought that meant that he was chosen to be an inheritor. <laughs> no, um, it, 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 it's prophesying what's going to happen. I was going to say the brothers. It's prophesying his role, um, their spiritual meaning, but it's not the same thing as being given the, the birthright, but like Jake received rather than so. The birthright is given to Joseph. Uh, yeah. It's just it's just quite famous. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a nice thing. It literally is, you know, like you have two kids, why you say, Oh, I love you, you're special out here. You're special. <laughs> and that's why I love the it was because yeah. his father was quite famous. His father wanted Rachel first and then got tricked into. Sure. <laughs> but you understand why his brother didn't want that. I know. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of. Yeah. 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 And it goes back to the fact that as he could eat the money, he had many, many marriages, problems with this. Like you have a, a man who loves his one wife better and gets her children better. I thought you told me that about it. <laughs> I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that it was... It's complicated. I just I misunderstood. Good. So the interesting thing about this, then, is that even though the kingship originally happens because of human sin, this rejection of God, this rejection, it's already been prepared for. And what has already been prophesied hundreds of years in the past? And what's about 600 years in the past? What this means is that even if the people had the faith, there may have been a king. What have happened this way? Uh, but you already had a preparation for this and the answer to this. You know, even before the people said, God has the healing and the response already. God already had everything here. 
God's already planning for the redemption and healing, which will then will use to bring forward all the world into salvation. They'll use it to bring forth the Messiah, use it to bring forth a redemption, to bring forth healing, the passion cross. Questions? So, Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul is um, somebody that, humanly speaking, you would definitely pick to be king. He was a tall, strong man, was good looking, um, well liked. The first didn't have any ambitions. Um, but as you go on, you'll see that, unfortunately, the problem that Saul has is Saul is very pragmatic. Saul would fit very well into the modern milieu, which is that if following God works, great. If it doesn't, well, we'll go with what works instead. Um, and that, that's who Saul is. I mean, Saul is not a bad person, but Saul is not very dedicated to what others will see. And because of that, when the people the people stray, the people stray. But Saul, before he's king, is just this guy, and he's helping his father out, and his father's daughters get lost. Donkeys are expensive. And so he goes running around trying to find donkeys. And he thinks to himself, I can't find them. I'll go to Samuel over in Jerusalem. Oh, he doesn't, sorry, the child. Jerusalem hasn't found it. Yeah, excuse me. I'll go over to uh, Samuel. Samuel the prophet, I'll ask him to tell me the donkey. Then my father the donkey. This is not me. And Samuel's the prophet. He just would be up. But that they go yet. He's that's it's kind of we'll see them later, it's kind of so, Saul's MO. But other says a few times. Where he kind of wants answers supernaturally, it's all listen to that, but he does so. He leaves it. Uh, the other Samuel, Samuel sees him, and he knows this is the one that was picked. He only some king in there. So he goes from being looking for donkeys to becoming king. <laughs> <laughs> and he is anointed. Samuel takes a horn of oil, anoints him. And from then on, the Spirit of the Lord, when he rushes upon him, fills him, and gives him for the power. Where else in Scripture do we see the Holy Spirit? Coming upon people and giving them authority and power. Psalm. So before that, the psalm is added. So, yeah. Good, it's true. It doesn't happen to the psalm, it's happened to other people. But, but before Saul or Solomon's days, it is clearly that down the road. Moses and the 72. Right? Remember the 72 people he picked, so they get anointed and they. The authority and power of judges. This is a big deal. This is, you might say, a proto Um It's not a sacrament per se because it's not from Christ. Um, it's not so sanctified grace, uh, but it is a preparatory thing. Where through this anointing oil, God gives grace and God gives authority. This is a preparing for the sacraments of the New Testament. But the anointing God gives us authority, and God gives grace. Uh, but this is it's not a sacrament at this point, but it, it's a type, it's a preparation for it. And it does have a real effect. Um, the Middle Ages, in fact, because of things like this, there were people who, who would argue, would try to argue that kings being anointed, the kings were anointed until well into the Middle Ages. Actually, the last anointing king, I think, was in 1917. Um, I believe Carl Walsh was in. But then we get the Pope's anointing them, and then people would try to say, well, this, this is a sacrament. And this, so, well, this is a sacrament because it's not a spiritual thing. It's a, but there are people who, who would argue for the name sacrament because of the fact you see the scriptures. The fact is that God comes and God gives all the God gives Saul power. God walks with Saul. God says, I'm going with you. You're going to lead my people. You're going to be king. And he is. 
And so Saul begins a campaign against the Philistines. The Philistines still have power. The Philistines, again, during Samuel's lifetime, don't involve Israel. But they're gaining power, they're, they're gaining uh, military might now. And now King Saul, the rest of his life, is going to be fighting against the Philistines. In fact, he reigns for 42 years. So Saul is there fighting the Philistines. The first big battle, or one of the first big battles, takes place at a place called Geba. And a couple of things happen. So originally, since Saul was nobody originally, he's the only king, God gave him authority and power. But no one knows him. The reason he doesn't have very many followers. And so he begins this big battle with only 600 men. But the opposite happens with him and Gideon. Because people hear about what he's doing, people get excited about him, blow Samuel over him. And so when they realize he's going to attack the Philistines, 10,000 gallons. Remember last time we talked, or a couple times ago, we talked about Gideon. And originally Gideon had 32,000 men, about that's many, and we get rid of them. Doesn't happen to set us all. They begin this big battle, they're preparing for the battle. And they want to wait for Samuel to come to offer sacrifice, asking God to bless the soldiers and protect them from the battle of death. And Samuel's like, and Samuel is late for seven days. And the men begin to get bored and nervous, and the first rush is to wear off and into the desert. And so Saul says, Well, can't wait. I'm losing my men. We have to do this battle now where he's going to put on up men here. All of the sacrifices. Instead. And so Saul offers sacrifice to the Lord. After all, he's anointed. And they win the battle. And then Samuel comes and says this. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave. If you had done this, you would establish your kingdom over Israel for all time. And now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart to find the ruler of his people, but you have not kept the Lord's command. So Saul trusted not in God, but in his own power. In fact, Saul usurped his own, the power of the spiritual Lord, and he offered sacrifice falsely. So what happens in the Old Testament? He offered sacrifice falsely. Bad things, man. <laughs> <laughs> now at this point, we don't see anything happen to Saul personally. He is the Lord's anointed. He is the anointed one of the Lord. He is a type of the Messiah. He is the king of Israel. So no, no, there's no punishment at this point, except he's told, because you did this, you're a kingship on the Because he's trying to establish a kingship not upon God's power, but upon his own power. He's trying to make the king of Israel be about his line, his authority, his own good. Where God wants it to be on the authority of himself, the nation of God, and on the law. But the king was not supposed to be, God asked not for king, anointed the king. Not as a substitution or rejection of the law or rejection of himself, but as he called to go back and bring people to him. To say, your leader will then bring you to my team. Your leader will then be the one to show me, to, to give me back my price. So Christ, Christ is the one who ultimately brings back the glory of God, the Israel. Christ then rules as God and as man. And he, he heals his perfect. 
Saul is destroying the sea. Because Saul is now making the priesthood and the sacrifice of God himself be subservient to his, to his own kingdom. Right? He wants Samuel and God to, to answer him. He wants God to be, to, to be under his authority as well. And this is why he loses his kingdom. This is why he thought that. And we'll see this later on. It comes to, to, to Solomon's son. And we see that Sol Solomon's son, the kingdom splits and ten tribes are lost. Um, the same reason, because they want to make religion subservient to the kingdom rather than the other way around. Um, and there is this complicated relationship. There's a complicated relationship here because you do have an earthly authority, an earthly power. It is very much tied to God and to religion. It's complicated because they're, they're different things. But they unite. They unite. Uh, he wants to use God? Basically, he, he wants to do anything he can to keep himself in power. Um, and so he doesn't really care about. God's laws over the other. I mean, and, and he wants to be talked out. Yeah. yeah. But basically, he's very pragmatic, right? I mean, he, he's, the sacrifices are for the people. Yes, God said no, but the sacrifices are not I'm going to do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, later on, we'll see the actual who go to the practice which way. Because he wants an answer, right? an answer from God. So go to the Salt Media. He's very pragmatic. He's in he very well in today's politics. Oh, and yeah. whatever works, do it. So he wants to be God almost. You see? Basically, he wants God to be second. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think he's saying that. I don't think he's saying that out loud. Mm -hmm. But basically, his, he's convinced that he's always right. And that as long as everyone's cool and calm and, and everyone's great, it doesn't matter what he does. Which is why he loses his future. Yeah. But, but not to the end of his death. He not really does. He and his son die together. But at this point, Samuel is, we need to solve it. At this point, so the, it's a kind of first warning. He's told, okay, you're going to be king, there'll be no dynasty after you. And you think maybe he learned more. Next big battle is against Amalek. The Amalekites, um, so the king of Amalek, they were at war with the king of Gog, which is a fun name to say. <laughs> And they're told that the Amalek is on the bat. Right. What's the bat? Everybody gets killed, everything gets destroyed. Not just people, but the, the, the livestock, the gold, is, nothing is kept. Because it's all contained by sin. And he's trying to stop the kind of sin. This is the God of the judge of the king. But Saul, being a dramatic guy, he wins it today, comes the kingdom, and says, you know what? I don't want to kill all that. I'm going to spare him. I'm going to kill God. I'm going to spare him. He spares the king. He keeps the best of the stuff for himself. There's a portion of the temple, so he can release that beast. He says, it's for God. I don't want to make it. But he can't do that. So he loses he lose, he lose, he lose the, uh, the fallen kingdom. And part of the reason why he learned the band too was that the people weren't going to go to war and loot for their own personal gain, right? If you're not going to gain anything personally, the money and plunder and you know, wealth, you must have reason to go to war. But Saul likes the money and plunder and wealth. And finally, he builds for himself a triumphal monument, hard to climb. Um, so there's a monument that he builds to saying, here's my victory, you know, I saw this day, Conquered all the looking to God, and weren't I wonderful? And 
here we go to the area says why he goes from sorrow. And our Lord the Santa Walk very English. And he asked him, what did you done? He said, oh, well, yeah, it was, it was, you know, I could be this cruel, I could have kill everybody. I, I was really saving the treasure for God, and, you know, well, you weren't. And Samuel then responds with this. He says, has the Lord, as great lion and offering and sacrifices, right? Because Saul is going to be giving, you know, the, the best one in the temple. The best is going to go with the God. To offer these sacrifices. That's why I, I kept livestock. That's why I kept the gold and silver. That's why I felt like he gave me sacrifices. Has the Lord is great to the lions and we're offering the sacrifices. As the obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey the better than sacrifice, and the heart will listen to obey the fat of rounds. Rebellion is like the sin of divination, witchcraft, <coughs> caught upon a false god. And stubbornness is literally a dog. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he rejected you from being king. It's his own fault. He's too selfish. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this is a theme throughout humanity, right? I mean, we like blaming God for the bad things happen, but whose fault is it that we suffer? It's a good thing we're much smarter than those dumb people of the Old Testament, right? <laughs> Boy. Um, what is a sacrifice? See, we get here an interesting discussion, interesting revelation about why a sacrifice matters and what it was actually for. What is a sacrifice? It's a stand in for atonement. Stand for atonement? Uh, and so what happens? God the best ram or whatever, the best of what we have or what we do. In their case, we raise animals. And the best that we have is to God? What happens to the animal? It dies. It dies. But don't they have to eat it in order to follow through with the sacrifice? So a portion is eaten, a portion uh, would be depending on the animal. Um, and so, why? What's being signified? Is, is, is it just that the Lord hates these rams, or the Lord's really hungry? You know, you know Psalm 50 says, it said, I don't eat, I don't eat goats and, and rams. Stop because you give me goats and sheep, but I'm happy. Uh, you know, if, if you give me plenty of, of, of meat. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you guys. I'm the kind of, I own the world. <laughs> so that's basically what Psalm 50 says. You think you eat the blood of goats and then drink of the flesh of cows? I don't really tell you. Um, so what? What? What is that? Reparations. Reparation. But should have what? It, it is a reparation. It is referring to sin. It is. I mean, there's four reasons for it. Um, the four reasons for a sacrifice depend, is first of all adoration. Second of all, it is supplication, asking the Lord to uh, give us what we need. And there's thanksgiving. Contrition, reparation, yeah. Acts, yep. Yeah, so, so, so these are the four reasons that there are sacrifices. And how does this fit in with covenant. So a covenant <laughs> So a covenant is a union 
between families and peoples. And this comes to God's God man um, that is sealed by sacrifice. So the covenant is this agreement, this union. This covenant basically says that we are so close that if we break this union, what happens to the animal happens to us. You know, the animal dies. And so if I break the union, it's like we're being torn apart. We are one flesh. Uh, we, we are one. So it's, there's marriage covenants. There's also covenants between families. There's covenants between nations. And they're saying we're becoming united. We're one. And you know, they would take a animal. They would rip it in half. And they'd walk through it together. And they basically, um, if we break this covenant between us, we're going rip in half. So we rip our own flesh in half because we are that united. It's that much of a permanent bond, a sacred bond, so much sacrifice of God. So it's related, but it's not the same thing. Why is there a, a, a death here? So it, it's, it's the heart of every sacrifice. It's saying is God owns all this perfect. And so it's signifying that God is the creator and the owner and the source of existence. Right? And so when the animal dies, when the wine is poured out, when the flower is burned on the altar, what's saying is this only exists because of God. That God is the source of existence. And this is a standard for my own heart. So what I'm saying is, I offer to God my part, my life, my own existence, my own being. But God owns this, is owned my love. God is the one who created me. God is the one who owns me. God is the one who keeps me alive. So why is it then that obedient that if you ever sacrifice in the wrong way, in a disobedience or falsely, or not according to God's commandments, it's a bad sacrifice? Why? Because he, obedience, like even Jesus was obedient. Mm -hmm. Because a disobedience is the opposite of what a sacrifice is. So, so in your heart you're saying, I'm not listening to God, God's not important. And by the act you're saying, God's important. So you're telling lies. Right? Because the, the important part of the sacrifice is the heart. Is the center of your being. And so when Saul offers sacrifice and disobedience and rebellion, it's a worthless sacrifice. It's not a real sacrifice. Externally it is, but it's not, it's not a real sacrifice. You know, it's like somebody who is manipulating you and using you and saying, Oh, I love you so much. Therefore, you have to do what I want you to do. Because I love you. If you love me, you ever want. That's not love. It sounds like it might look like love within the surface of it, but it's the opposite. Right? Yeah. And so what's happening here, the reason, the reason why it's being rejected is because Saul was trying to offer sacrifice merely from the external thing. Merely external. And he's, he's giving out his own. He's a Pharisee. <laughs> he's a human being. <laughs> He's offering sacrifice for his own will. It's like God says, I want to eat it from your heart. I don't, need, I don't need you to give me a goat. I don't need you to give me gold. You can't bribe me. The salt come off of God, look the other way, here's a rock, here's a, here's a cup. I don't need you to go get gold out of from me. I own that. I need you to go listen and obey and bring my people to listen and obey. Remember, by sinning, He's everyone else. He's the king now. Everyone else is being led astray as well. 
When he obeys, when the king obeys, the people fall. When the king disobeys, the people fall. Aren't they following in good faith? Possibly, possibly not. It's good, that's going to depend on the person. Um, and so it's, in some cases, that would, would excuse them. In some cases, it would. Um, it's, um, think of the story of Nuremberg trials. Right? What was the defense? Just one horse. Just one horse. You know, certain things, it's not going to apply to certain things. Um, when it comes to things that are clearly against God's will and commands, um, but it does, humanly speaking, makes it harder, right? If, if your leaders are doing the wrong thing, whether, whether they're human leaders, whether they're spiritual leaders, whether they're your parents, or it's, it's people that are not if your leaders are doing the wrong thing, it's harder for the followers to do what they're right. right? Because your role as leader is to lead. And if you're dragging the hell instead, you're not leading. And so there's serious consequences. That's why, that's why he can't be king. Because he is not, he's not doing the job. And so this is a, a very important point. Um, but but yes, they certainly are, are lesser at fault than, than Saul. And so this is why Samuel goes to Saul, uh, the soldiers. Samuel goes to the soldiers and then say, uh, "You idiots! How dare you do this?" He goes to Saul and says, "What are we do? You know, how dare you do this?" This is, um, this is why later on, King David falls. He does fall a lot. Um, Nathan goes to David and says, what are you doing? Now, in that case, a couple of times it does fall on people uh, because it, they also were, were at fault. Uh, but the one who gets addressed and yelled at contempt is the leader. Uh, sort of a much harsher punishment. Uh, yeah, so, so let's, there is this... <coughs> Give to our sacrifice. As you have it once again here, this playing with the religion, with religion, right? The first time he was holding on to the kingship, it was because he offered sacrifice himself. Second time, it's that was just I'm just being merciful. I'm not merciful. But he's just, he's just playing. He's, he's yeah, trying to offer sacrifice to make his home. And then this happens, he goes into the mouth. See, I can love him. He's good now. I mean, the dog. He kills the dog like that. If I kill the dog, I'm a good man. I obey God. But both of these things, what he's doing is he's using religion to bolster his kingdom. He's taking God and using religion to make himself more powerful. Right? He's taking the, the truth, he's taking God. Right? And playing games. And because of this, it can't be king. The thought or question is just sitting. I just said stupid. <laughs> sin is. <laughs> what sin isn't stupid? You can name one all the way. No, it's a good, no, it's a good point. It's an important point. The problem is that when we're tempted to sin, think of think isn't this smart? This is a good thing to do. Oh, I, I, this is the best thing to do. This is great. This feels so good. This must be smart. It's not. No, no sins are ever sins. And the thing is, the more you sometimes stupider you get. <laughs> right? Because then, then you start convincing yourself for all the reasons why you're right. And then all the reasons why it's okay to do these things. You end up not being repentant because it's stupid. <laughs> the Lord quotes this in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, the story we're all familiar with, a story that was supposed to tie into Ruth, but I didn't think Ruth could be talked to one of the things. <laughs> but perhaps you'll hear it and recognize how it ties in. You get to. So let's read Matthew chapter 12, verse 1 of the way. I have a quote there for you, if I look up in your Bible, it's fine too. At that, at the very bottom of the page, the next one. At that time, she just went to the grain field going to Sabbath. 
His disciples were hungry and began to pluck ears of grain to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, there is sight for you as a awful of the old Sabbath. He said to them, Do not write what David did, for that he was hungry, and those who were with him. Right in the house of God, and ate the bread of Pharisees in the presence. The law for him to eat, and for those who were with him, and only the priests. For having not read the law, nor on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple were right the Sabbath, and are guiltless. I tell you something where the temple is here. And if you have done what this means, that thy mercy not sacrifice, but you do not condemn the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, this is one of the verses that gets abused a lot. It's what Bible does. This one gets abused, gets abused a lot. And people will try to tell you, well, what this means is that rules aren't important. What's important is being nice and kind to people and see God's mercy. Don't listen to the rules as long as there's a good reason for it. That's all. That's not what this means. Let's look at what this means. But first of all, what is the Sabbath? It used to be Saturday without Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what has happened? Day of rest. A day for God. Day of rest for God. And so in the Old Testament, there's two reasons for it. The first reason is you're sharing in the what? Creation. So you're sharing in the rest of creation? Resurrection. Old Testament. That's true. New Testament, you're right. Uh, the resurrection includes both of these sharing in the rest of God after creation. The blessing of God after creation. The point of God by day in the first place. They're living with God. And also is, what's the other reason Old Testament? Do you remember? Let's do an Exodus. We're not slaves. You're freed by God. So the point is that you've been freed by God, you've been redeemed by God, you've been saved by God, you're a free person from God himself, and you're sharing God's life. Which of course then gets taken up into the resurrection on Sunday, where we're truly free and truly sharing God's life and God's rest in heaven. Uh, these, the real Sabbath rest. Now what happened here historically is that Throughout history, the Jewish people, like all people, uh, don't, they don't obey the mounts. And they fall away. And they, they get punished by God. And they come back. And then they fall away again. And then over and over and over. Finally, in the year 587, they get exiled with that. And after 70 years, they come back. At that point, a group of men call themselves the Pharisees. And they say, we're very careful about the law. The Pharisees are men, from the word Thresh, meaning separated ones. And, they, and their whole point is, you must obey the law very carefully. And so they say, and all they're going to obey the words of the law, are going to make sure there's not even a chance of going to break the law. They begin adding interpretations to it, adding things to it. It begins. I believe, well intentioned. Uh, it doesn't end there, unfortunately, it ends up in a, in a strange place. But it begins, the, the, the reason why it was started was because people were concerned about following God's command. And so what they would say is if God's command is don't work on the Sabbath, what does that mean? You know, they would have debates. The chicken lays an egg on the Sabbath. The chicken does work. We eat the egg later on the Sabbath, and I show them the work of the chicken. And therefore, they break the law. And it sounds very silly to us, but these are men who are trying to please to God, trying to love God, trying to obey Him. And if it was done truly out of that act of love, that could be a very beautiful thing. If it's done simply thinking, as long as I keep God in the box, I'm okay, it's a bad thing. And depending on who you're talking about, right? And even the Pharisees will yell at each other if that's a different story. Um, <laughs> but remember in the book of Ruth. Okay, so Sabbath is a day of rest, you can't do work, 
Uh, and they, they were very carefully defined how far you could walk. That's seven miles, more than seven miles, it was broken or shattered breast. You couldn't carry things. Remember, the, the man who's, who's paralyzed carries a mat. They can't carry out even work on the Sabbath. So, first of all, are the, um, are the, are the disciples stealing? They're plucking the grain from the field that are there, so they steal. Those are the ones that are from the soldier, that are stealing? Yeah, so remember from the soldier of Ruth, where we're, we're, we're yeah. full of belief. Yeah. yeah. They're not stealing. So, what are the Pharisees mad about? So, so what, what are they doing? That they're plucking, they're harvesting, they're working. and they're threshing. They get, in order to eat, they cross the grain. What you mean? Right? So it's not that, that, that they're, they're stealing, they're doing bad things, it's that they're doing work on the Sabbath. They're plucking, they're harvesting, and they're threshing the grain to get out the husk. And so that's what, they, that's what the fairies say, we're doing the work, we're breaking the Sabbath. No problem, you know, pity. <laughs> and this is why the Lord yells at them. And so this is about, the Lord is not saying rules don't matter. What he's saying is the rules don't matter for their own sin. The rules matter for God's sake, but lead to God. And because of that, there are, there are the hierarchy of rules. There's a greater thing here. What he's saying is that for example, he sits over here and he says, yes, ordinarily, you know, the bread of presence is not, not for most people. But everyone said they did the right thing when they ate the bread of presence. We didn't starve them. You know, it wasn't, it, it, the bread of presence was a symbolic uh, loaf. There were 12 of them placed before, before, the, before the altar and left there for, for seven days and then we were punished and the old bread had been eaten by the priests. So it was the old bread that, that was, it wasn't, Break, was it wasn't wasn't the frame of time to have that. All but it was basically giving away his house. So that was being given to David and his men to keep him alive, to help them uh, survive. Uh, and the Lord says, everyone knows that was okay. It's not going to be an ordinary thing, but in usual circumstances, you can do that. Just like if someone were starving at my feet, all I had was unused hosts, I'd give them unused hosts, right? Well, consecrated hosts, different story. But if I have unconsecrated hosts, I can't say, well, go ahead and starve, sorry. I should give them a consecrated host that won't starve. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. Well, the priests work on the Sabbath, they're offering sacrifice. They're, they're, they're praising God. They're, they're, they're working hard. <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing so. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes and says two things. The very important telling who he is. He three things. First, he says the priests work in the temple and don't break the Sabbath because why? Because they live with God. They are not slaves, but they are free men of God, making God the first. They are living with God, resting with God. They are keeping the Sabbath. They're not. They're doing work. But they are doing with the point of the Sabbath. It is for God that they're keeping these things. The temple is where God is present. There's something very in the temple here. That's what he's saying. When he says something very in the temple, you're saying about himself. He's gone. He's gone. In the book of Samuel, Samuel is rejected as king because he, the Lord desired to worship on Sabbath. What is he saying he is? He's, he's quoting the Lord of Samuel. He's saying he's king. He's saying he is king, right? I am the true king who comes off the true sacrifice, who comes off the sacrifice of my way. I am the high priest. I am God himself. Right? So he quotes back the book of Samuel. Saul was rejected. And someone else will be king after him instead. Christ is saying, I have come. The true king who replaces Saul, replaces man, replaces the one of these false sacrifices, come, and here I am. And so I have the right to tell my disciples to, you know, even if I would change the temple rules, I can tell them they can serve me and work with me. You know, and this is, you know, because of who I am. 
I am king, I am priest, I am God. Please go back and show us that perfection of, of who comes to replace Saul, the one to whom the scepter truly belongs. And so at this point, Samuel is told to one day. Um, and so Samuel goes out and he is nervous that Saul will hear about it and kill him. So he does it in secret. He goes and he says, I want a feast and I want um, all of them to be there. And he's avoided by telling who this is. And Jesse, who is the grandson of Ruth, uh, has uh, eight sons. And every time that comes in, Samuel goes, that's going to be him. Now, this, this guy is tall, he's strong, he's handsome, he's, he's got to be him. Got to be him. And the Lord said, not him. Next one, let's go again. Surely this is he. Surely this is the one that's going to be king at that. Uh, and finally, the, you know, he's, he goes down and says, Well, this is all the sons you have? And he says, Oh, yeah, I got one more son, and he's turning the sheep. And that's right, there's David. I got this. And one, he comes in, the Lord says, Here is one who I have chosen, anoint him. Because the Lord is not judged by the appearance, but by the heart. Later on, David gets called a man for God's own heart. Right? Soul, in his heart, does not follow that. Uh, he wants man for his own heart. I will choose someone after my own heart. Uh, the book of Samuel, chapter, chapter 3, then. Or uh, someone after man after his own heart. David is the one who is a man after God's own heart. And this is in spite of his sins. This is in spite of his weakness, in spite of his fault, in spite of his failures. How does David can still be a man after God's own heart, even though he's an adulterer, he's a murderer, he's a proud man, he's a thief, he, he does some bad things. He's a murderer, but he's, he fights. He's not the most virtuous of men. But how is he going to manage the God's own heart? He's always asking God. He's always praying. What else? Stop. Repentance. Repentance, yeah. He's always coming back to God. See, the Lord doesn't... The Lord makes to David. He doesn't pick a king who is perfect. He couldn't. He could have picked the man who had never sinned. He could have picked the man who had been an angel. He picks a sinner. But he picks a man who perseveres, who lives up again, always asks God for forgiveness. Just like Israel. Israel is God's rock. Israel is God's king. Israel is God's chosen, God's precious rock. Israel sins all. But always comes back. Always go back to God. Just like God's church. Yes, you know, Unfortunately, like a lot of us here. Maybe some of you hear angels are perfect. <laughs> but some of you aren't. Well, they may. I'm like the only one in the room that knows everything about <laughs> Well, I know those people are going to be the anyway, so who knows? <laughs> but one of the things we're being told here is that when it come to follow God's heart, yes, don't sin. Well, I'm not saying sin is okay. But the most important thing is do you repent, you come back to God, and keep trying. And even if we fall and fail, or even, even if we're weak, even if we mess up that. The Lord always calls us back. If you come back to God and repent and return 
and seek God truly. Lord will make your heart like himself, or Lord will bring it back to himself, and Lord will even call us one of his own. For the purpose, purify us, and heal us, and forgive us, and make us like himself. And that's a very consoling thing. That's a very beautiful thing. The Lord says to us, in spite of your sins, I choose you. And in spite of your sins, I heal you. I make you like unto myself. I make your heart like my heart. A heart for the care of my life my children. A heart that seeks God first. A heart that rejects sin. A heart that seeks holiness. So David, in spite of everything that he can say, he is He's the serious head of church. It's all the song. Now, hopefully, he didn't have him anyway, but he's not. So there's no peace day for his soul. There's a peace day for David. One last thing, and then we'll end on time once. It's supposed to be out of law. Normally, it's never out of law. This class is always supposed to be an hour long. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was like supposed to be over like 7 30. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I no, missed the first class. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> you know, 7, 7 30, 8, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's all over the ballpark. <laughs> but but you know, 7 is sort of what it's supposed to be. You can't do that. Positive <laughs> hour. <laughs> Evil spirit from the Lord. It's unclear whether this is depression, whether it's schizophrenia, uh, whether it is um, a chastising spirit. But something happens to Saul apparently, he kind of goes into a bunk. Where he doesn't really do anything, maybe that is the case that the depression perhaps. Uh, and, and he's not able to do it. Why would they say the Spirit of the Lord? A couple of reasons, perhaps. For one is God allows it. So it's not that God wills evil, but he sometimes allows it for our own good. What else could be going on? So if it's not an evil spirit as in the sense of a demon, if it's simply a quiet description of mental illness. Uh, if so if you think so, so sometimes in the scripture, for example, it's clear that there are demons. Sometimes it's, it's clear that they can diagnose them not as as um, and as fallen angels, but rather as um, diseases. Uh, and even New Testament, we see that there are times when there it's the way disease <laughs> could be, but it'll be, it, it occurred young then. It could be the bad show. Some old folks get that stuff. <laughs> Not you, though, right? No. No. <laughs> um, so, if it is a mental illness and not an evil spirit, but that, that's, that's what it, um, then it would be a chastisement as a call to repentance. It would be God saying to Saul, you're not all that. You're not, not the key thing you are. Then once in a while you get brought to your knees if you have to, you, you can't do by yourself, you can't function normally. You're being told you're not God. If it was truly mental illness, wouldn't that be something that he wasn't responsible for? Or was it? You mean the Lord? No, no, no. Saul. Yeah. Uh, yes, 
Um, it wouldn't would be responsible for it, but... I it, mean, as far as like it being like sinful or... But it, it is a punishment or it's allowed because it was passed. Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. Um, or the humble... Or the humble right. table, or the humble table, because... And we'll see it leads to him again, kind of pulling back the things, he had a terrible temper, he tried to kill people, he has a temper, he is the swamp. Um, and because of this, because of this, again, I'm going to get into probably like, like a severe depression, but who knows. Um, but it's called repentance. It's, it's called to recognize God does God That's also why he's a right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it would work either way. Um, so, it's one of those things where, where it's ambiguous. Remember, Saul, does, even though the death is king, he reigned 40 years. He still reigns for many years after. He still leads by battles. He's, he's, he's rejected as king. David is only king. David does not take over as the king of, of all of Israel until after Saul dies. Are people aware he's king at the time? That Saul's king? Or is that kept quiet? All depends on, on the time. Uh, a, after Goliath, it did become aware. That's part of the reason why Saul is jealous and then again tries to kill him. Oh, okay. uh, but that's next next week. Um, <laughs> Um, but what happens here is he gets into these periodic you know, bad moods, depressions, or attacks. But all that will cure him and help him is when the ability of David is um, lives nearby, he's good music, he's good voice, and, and Saul asks him to play. And whenever Saul, whenever David begins to play, Saul's movements, evil spirit please. Whenever we run away, whatever's happening literally is this, you know, it's, you can then function. The thing about David and Goliath is, is David is not unknown to Saul. He's not seen as a warrior, he's seen as a musician. He's not seen as, he's not this random guy that was seen with him. He, he's, he works for the king for, for a while before this, this, the event of David and Goliath built up. Next week, next but so at this point, David and Saul were working, and, and David begins to exercise ministry by healing and curing. Right. So the, what the rule of the king was to bring God back. What is what is David playing? He's playing praises to God. He's playing the psalms. And when this happens, when there's prayers, so the Saul is, is praying. That's when this begins to live. And when he and when he rejects that, like right, the murder of David, when he tries to do bad things, falls back into this, it's because he is pulling away from these prayers. And so we're being shown here in the scripture the importance of prayers, the importance of mercy, the importance of um, what to do when we are under attack. Whether it's physical stuff, the mental stuff, whether it's spiritual stuff. There would be Healing is going to come out through prayer, trust in God, love in our Lord, to be able to fix. What was the period of time between David, the call of David and the 42 years from Saul's reign and um, So Saul becomes king at the age of, of, of 30. Um, it would be. I want to say that this is where about the 20th or 30th year of King Saul. I have to double check my exact dates. Uh, but I think Saul only reigns about 15 or 20 years um, after. It, it does say in the Bible. Uh, I'm trying to remember off my head. Um, let me see if I have it real quick for you. Because it does say when Saul so when the. Uh, it does say. And during that time, does Saul know that David's been anointed? Eventually, he does. Yeah. But not right. Not not at this moment. Where he's playing. Not at this point. Oh, okay. Uh, not at this point. Uh, but he does. I said. I think, I think what he goes to life. But, um. So my understanding here. So the, the book of Second Samuel, chapter five. It says that David was thirty years old. He became king. 
we uh, oh, wow, that's in Hebrew. I would like to know what she. Hebrew as well. Um, yeah, uh, and, and so the anointing came there. The first, but, but so it, it, it's not. He's anointed. He's anointed as a uh, as a youth. But I don't think his age when he's a youth. Why would he be anointed several times? Was that several? What seven? No, seven. Why would he be anointed several times? So one is one is the spiritual authority. One is the public authority. So, so the political and the public authority. Um, so, this is happening. Well, tell you what, I'll look it up to find an answer to that because I'm not seeing it. Um, I am not seeing you know, an age really given or. Um, Here it says David was third in your soul and became king. That's referring to. To Hebron, the second one. Over, second. over in Hebron. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the question is how old would he have been when he went the first time about uh, by, by Samuel? Um, I don't think it said that. I think it said that he's a youth. Uh, and so a youth could be anywhere from. You know, 15 to 30. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure we're given the exact things, but so when, 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 so, so if, if David or if King Saul um, dies at 40 years as king, David would have been in Hebron seven years before that. So, so Saul would have been his, his uh, 60s, would have been 60. 65. Um, and so that would have meant that, um, so anywhere then between 10 to 15 years uh, of him being king first. So, so it, it's, again, it's, not, it's not clear because it's, it's, it's just because anything he's a youth. He's been born the first time. And he's going to be a But he's, he's on a bear for a bit and he plays, plays for Saul for a bit. I can see if I can, I can try to find those dates and things, oh, no. uh, but, <laughs> but it says it's not quite clear because I don't think it gives us an exact yeah. age. Okay. It says he's a youth, and then at 30 he becomes king. Uh, which at age 30, of course, is important because who else becomes publicly proclaimed himself king at the age of 30? Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. And David also reigned for 33 years over Israel and Judah. And so how old was Christ when he was crucified? Three. For some reason, the Lord knows what he did here. <laughs> um, good. Any other questions? <laughs> what was the time frame between, I guess, uh, Israel and Joseph to Saul? So, that was, all, that was yeah. Judges, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have here, it's about 700 years. So, so the, uh, there's about 370 years uh, there in Egypt. And then from Joshua, and then it's four years in the desert. And uh, 300 years after that from Joshua to Saul. So it looks a little over three, a little over 700, 710 years. So give or take. But yeah, so, so it's a while. Um, there's 14 judges, and I have a list that I've been have with me. I can get to the next time you want between uh, Joshua and Saul. That'll be the last one. Most of them do most evil inside of the world. Well, not the, the, the judges are the ones who bring them back. So the, the 14 judges between these 300 years are the ones who bring everyone back. But yes, they're, they're, 
It's a flip-flop and generational thing. A generation is great, and a generation is evil, which was good. Which was good. Even with the kings. At the, uh, yeah, it's, tell kings are better than others. That's why we follow the one. Other questions? All right, let's end. We're only late today, okay? <laughs> at 7 o'clock. And then we'll start going with King David uh, next time. Uh, real quick, well, we're going to begin our last class, two weeks, uh, for, for the summer. Two weeks? Is that just one more week? The 19th and the 26th. Yeah. Oh, morning. Oh, morning. A break before your vacation. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so my my something to think about. I'll we'll, we'll, we'll put it again on the twenty sixth and talk about it before that. So we look at the class. Yeah, we'll look at the class. Okay. Uh, Bishop Wall is reissuing his letter on the Eucharist uh, in a book form, and he has asked suggested that we study it as a parish. What would you think? If we come back in the fall, we start going through that letter of the Yeah, that's And what they had to say, the parish, every parish that we get books will have it. Uh, it's being put into an easier format with paragraph numbering and some other things. It has it, it's coming out. Um, I, I have seen it, but I, it's not printed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, I had a very small hand, uh, but, but but the three dioceses actually goes through. I did not go through. Uh, it's like the first newspaper that we had when we first got here. We autographed it. Yeah. <laughs> Your article. <laughs> <laughs> that you Only because you asked. I didn't. <laughs> 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 you just stand out on the corner with a pen. You know. Yeah, I just stand. Stop it. Oh, I'm going to get it. Jack is going to force the autograph of you. I saw that. So, when. Uh, are you going to take a break during the summer? Yes. yes. Okay. Take a break in the summer and then come back September ish. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get me some time to do some other things. I don't think it'll help I'm sure the rest of you probably would like to do it too. Okay. Uh, it's two more weeks, we'll, we'll cover what we can with David, and then we'll think about it. Um, and there's always things to cover, but there's plenty of people. Okay, let's close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for leading us to your, to your true people. May we always acknowledge you as King. May our hearts always follow your own heart. May we receive from the true King, your Son, Jesus Christ. The grace of holiness, make our hearts happy. And all that we say and do be to your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be. The world of God, and Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.